lovely to have you all. Um, good afternoon, good evening, depending on which part of the country you're in. We're happy to see you all and have us uh, have you all here together with us. Um, I'm Donnie Ronan with Shaker and Spoon. And with us today, we have Brian Miller, who's here from Brooklyn, New York, and Brianne Rupp, who's here from St. Augustine, Florida. And, um, and uh, Brian used to run a beautiful bar for those of you who had the opportunity to find one of the Midtown treasures in New York called the Polynesian, and also worked at Death & Co. and had a, a really glorious pop-up called Tiki Mondays with Miller. And, um, excuse me, just Mondays with Miller. And, uh, and, and focused always on tropical cocktails and rum and um, always found a way to wear a sarong, which you might be wearing. I, I can't see what you got. No, I went with jeans today. Okay. Um, and and, and Brie is uh, one of our upcoming Shaker and Spoon bartenders for our Rums of Origin 3 box. And she is a bartender at Boat Drinks, which is the other reason why I'm wearing this hat today. Mm -hmm. um, at Boat Drinks in St. Augustine, which was uh, um, opened and owned and operated by uh, two other stellar bartenders um, from Texas. And it's, it's a real pleasure to have you both. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, man. Absolutely. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna dive right in. Um, one of the things that I uh, promised to share with everybody today was a little bit of like, of behind the, you know, draw back the curtain uh, inside scoop on how we do things at Shaker and Spoon. So uh, one of the things that Brie did is when coming up with her cocktails, she created a couple of different cocktails to see what was going to um, fit the best into the overall box. And so for the most part, everyone's cocktails are always amazing. It's just a concept of like figuring out uh, to make sure that everyone's drinks are a little bit different so that when you open up the box, you don't have three things that are all the same, like same glassware or same style or same flavor. So uh, one of the drinks that uh, she came up with, also amazing, is that is what she's going to make. So you guys get to get a little bit of an inside scoop as to um, the other creation that she made. So Bree, take it away. Hello. Hi, am I good? Everybody hear me? Yes, okay. Awesome, yeah. So um, like Donnie said, um, when I was approached by uh, the box to make drinks um, was still during like lockdown time here. Now I live in Florida, I'm here in St. Augustine, Florida and um, things are fully open. It's kind of a wild place to be. Um, but during this time I got to have a lot of fun coming up with the recipes and immediately one of my first thoughts was how could I recreate like my favorite treat from growing up in Panama which was a street treat um they're called raspados and the raspaderos the guys who have the carts they walk around like the whole city and there are these metal carts so kind of like pre-yeti you know yeti before yeti they're like insulated carts and in the bottom, they have a huge block of ice, which now working in fancy cocktail bars and everything, um, I understand how that ice is made and why it's so fancy and so special. Those huge blocks that are really concentrated and don't have any air bubbles. And so they last all day. So the guys walk around the city and they have this shaver that goes on top of the ice and there's like a paper cone that goes into the top. So they shave the ice for you and it all piles up into the top of the cone and then they flip it open and they have all these syrups, all these different flavors, um, all totally natural. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> the grape one is the best. It's like bright purple, you know, it's just kind of like Kool-Aid and a syrup. No, that's how you know it's real grape when it's purple. When it's bright purple, right? Yeah. yeah. So um, they have all the syrups and you choose the syrup that you want and then they'll put like honey on top for extra or sweetened condensed milk. And so my favorite growing up was always maracuya, which is passion fruit. Um, and then the sweetened condensed milk was like, to this day, it's a total weakness for me. So I was trying to figure out how could somebody at home recreate this cocktail without freezing a giant block of ice and using a shaver and 
Um, there's a couple ways you can do it. One is like blending it, um, but I work at a frozen drink bar and I just know that like blending stuff at home and trying to give people instructions is never going to be the same equation. Um, I'm a little spoiled with the frozen drink texture right now. <laughs> um, and then the other one, which I'm going to show you guys today is like crushing some ice. So just making the drink and pouring it over crushed ice. But then the third, which is like my favorite way is basically doing like a granita. So you make your cocktail and put it into, and I'll show you guys that one also, put it into a, um, a container in the freezer and let it freeze for a couple hours and you can scrape the ice and then put it back in. And once it's fully frozen, you can scrape it. And this is like just an amazing consistency. And I got to tinker a lot to get just exactly right. The ratio of alcohol and water. And now I'm using the Chinola for the passion fruit. So um, my roommate and I during the lockdown portion, we're drinking a lot of tests. Raspados isn't wasn't too bad. Yeah, you're you're doing research. Everybody's been doing a lot of research over the past seven months. Yeah, yeah. So, totally. Yeah, I see a lot of I see a lot of nodding heads. A lot mm -hmm. of research going on. Yeah. It's a great time to live with a bartender, I think. Um, you know, or to be one. <laughs> so, um, make the drink. Yeah, go for it. So you're gonna you're gonna do the granita first, right? Yeah, so I'm going to show you guys the granita, and, and it's kind of like a cooking show. Like, I have one, you know, magically already ready in the freezer to show you. So um, the recipe for the granita um, is only one ounce of alcohol. So we're using the Panama Pacific rum. Um, this is the five-year. One ounce of that. And we'll be adding a little bit of rum in afterwards, so you can kind of... Um, you can make this now if you want and put it in your freezer. I'm responding to the chat. Are we making this too? You can make this now if you want and put it in the freezer and have it for later or for tomorrow. And you can also make the shaken one. Yeah, she's going to show you, um, she's going to showing you how she's doing the granita version um, of the raspado, uh, but also has a version that you can either do shake or that you can blend. So if you if you are making uh, making it along with her right now, you can absolutely do the the blend version. But if not, either way, we'll be posting um, all the recipes so that you have access to not only the recipe but also the instructions, which are very different from one another. Okay. So while he was saying that, I put in an ounce of chinola, an ounce I'm adding of honey syrup, which is as you all at home I'm sure already know, but just equal parts honey to hot water, the quantity, one ounce of rum, one ounce of the chinola, which is a passion fruit liqueur, the maracuya. I made a honey syrup and I did one ounce of that. And then lime juice, I'm only gonna put a quarter ounce in there. I'm going to post it also in into the chat so everybody can see the whole thing. And uh, this is, again, this is the granita version. I'm going to change it so I can see everybody and not just, it'll be nicer. Okay, yeah, that's so much. Hello, everybody. Look, that's look, there's people. <laughs> wow. <laughs> there's real people out there. Okay, so I put in a quarter of lime. Um, I love salt and everything, especially uh, I'm going to add sweet and condensed milk on top and make it a little sweeter. So I just put a little crack of salt and then water because I want to make this to a consistency that will still semi freeze. Um, if it was all just alcohol, it might never freeze in the fridge. So I'm getting it just right with three and a half ounces of water. And she was saying before how, you know, they were again, they were doing a lot of research and development at home. But for these kinds of cocktails where you're really trying to, or these kinds of drinks in general, where you're trying to get a perfect consistency, um, it's, it's important that you play around because, you know, between throwing in um, Chinola, which is the passion fruit liqueur, instead of passion fruit syrup, um, it's going to change a little bit the way it freezes. And obviously, you're going to have to tweak how much water you put in it. And this is also something that she's freezing overnight. So there's a lot of different layers that uh, a lot of different things that come into play when trying to get the right consistency for granita. Yes. 
So I feel really confident in the recipe that Danny's going to give you guys, though, because I did a lot of a lot of work on this one. <laughs> um, and you'll notice, though, depending on the container that you put it in, some will start to freeze faster if it's more shallow and wide. So if you want to like double up on this recipe, it's good to just think about um, the dimensions of your container. I'm going to put it in the freezer uncovered. And then magically pull out a finished one. Yes. And on the cooking show, here we go. This one I put in at four o'clock today and like, Two hours later, no, three o'clock, three o'clock today. Two hours later, I just scraped it because it was freezing a little bit on the top and then I put it back in. And I don't know if you guys are going to be able to see this, but it's very satisfying. Just kind of scraping up and it's, it's so great because the ice, you know, has the flavor to it versus the other ways we're going to do it, like pouring over crushed ice. But this is like, you just want to, I'm just going to eat it. It's so good. So, so the consistency that you're looking for is is like a shaved ice so it's mm -hmm. going to be it's going to be kind of fluffy yeah it's super fluffy i i don't know if you can see that that well but it's really good so for that one i'm gonna put it a bowl would actually probably be nice for this since it's kind of like desserty and it is you know a drink that's trying to kind of mimic um a street food so a bowl could be nice, but I have these glasses. When you took that, when you put your fork in for the first time, I honestly thought it was going straight in your mouth. I like when you put it into the glass, it confused me for a second. Mm. I'm so good. Okay, and then I would put a little bit of um, sweet and condensed milk on top of that. That's an option for you. Taste it like that if you like it, just that way that's great. I would also probably add a half ounce or a whole other ounce of rum to it because I'm a lush. But I have to make, I have to make the other cocktail to show you, so I'll wait on that. So uh, you have a question while you're working on this. Um, Amy asked, why do you have it uncovered when you freeze it? I just, I, I, this is not like backed by science. I'm not a scientist. I'm just a bartender. But I just found that it froze faster <laughs> than I did it that way. Um, I think because if you um, cover it, maybe it just doesn't get as much cold as fast. I'm not sure. I just found it to work. Amy, does that answer your question? Um, <laughs> But I will, say, I will say the really cool thing about this is that after it's gotten to that consistency, if you cover it, you can put it back in the freezer and it's like a little tasty treat for you whenever you want it with alcohol in it. That sounds wonderful. Yes. And folks can always make, you know, you can always make um, a little bit more of a yield than expected. Um, and then you know, scoop out just a little bit at a time and do like the drizzle of the, um, of the sweetened condensed milk at the end, you know, or, or have like, um, you know, a larger bowl in your freezer. It, it, it is preferable to use a, a dish like Breeze, which is like a, a, a flatter dish because it will freeze better and allow you to scrape rather than doing it in something taller. So if you have like a casserole pan, um, that's going to work best. And don't worry about using glass. If you're following her recipe, it will not freeze to the point that it will hurt that glass. Yes. Just to be sure, like when you're freezing any liquid, just make sure there's enough space in the container. Even though you're not covering it, it's going to expand. You don't really want it to expand and maybe over, overflow. Yeah, expand, overflow, or break. So if you're not sure and it's not something that you are, you know, are fully aware of a a perfect recipe already prepared, then honestly use a plastic container. You'll be very sad if something shatters in your freezer, if, if glass shatters in your freezer. Um, Brie, can we, does anyone have any more um, questions for Brie while we're prepping for our next little segment? If you do, please feel free uh, to pop anything into the chat and we'll do both uh, a Q&A after the various segments and then again at the end. So if you have any questions, make sure that you, you pop them in the chat. Um, what we're gonna do is actually do a, um, 
uh, a quick little version uh, that you want to do the shaken version? Yeah, I already built it and okay. I can explain. I, are we on time? Or? Oh yeah, we're good. Don't sweat it. Okay. Um, all right. So this one is just a little bit of a different recipe, obviously, because we're not adding the water, we're shaking it and we're adding more booze. This will be in the email, but it was an ounce and a half of the rum, an ounce of the chinola, an ounce of the honey syrup again, and then a half ounce of lime and a little bit of salt. And then this one's kind of fun to like get your aggression out. You know, if, if anyone's frustrated with anything right now, I don't know what possibly anyone could be frustrated about. Basically. Everybody's doing great. No problems. <laughs> Everyone's doing great. After uh, and y'all, I, I posted, I posted your blended or crush recipe in the chat too. So you guys can see that it's a little bit different. Okay. Awesome. So I just have um, a bag of ice in a, in a Ziploc bag and I'm putting it in between two dish towels and um, it's on a sturdy enough surface that's not going to be damaged. And I'm just going to use my juice squeezer, but you can use a mallet or a rolling pin or, you know, whatever. It just, Oh, I was going to say, don't mute so we can actually hear hear that, but that's fine. Uh, for, the, for those of you who have, um, who have like the mallet at home, uh, like for example, um, I didn't bother for the longest time to have a, a, a specific mallet for ice crushing because I had a, a rubber hammer that I used for camping to like nail in your tent spikes. And so I was like, why would I go? But if you get that, like the one that's um, in the Make More store, it, you can use the flat edge on the side as well. It honestly looks like Thor's hammer, but so it's like this, it looks like an a, a battle ax, but it has this beautiful flat edge where you can get almost all of it all at the same time. It's pretty great. So I'm going to be fully transparent with you guys. I um, really went at that bag and it kind of busted. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so, you know. The beauty is we'll never know whether or not there are pieces of towel or plastic bag in your drink. Yeah, you can't that's the here, towel so. caught everything, so so it's good. So I'm gonna actually use some of the crushed ice too to shake my drink with, since I have it right here. And um. now, um, Brian considering the fact that you had such like an extensive ice program at, at a lot of the places where you worked, is there a reason when you make the choice between shaking on cubed versus crushed? Uh, well, whenever I do anything on crushed ice, I always shake it with a couple of ice cubes just because you, it, once you pour hot alcohol on crushed ice, it's going to immediately start to melt. So you want to get it a little bit cold, add a little bit of dilution before you put it on crushed ice. At least that's just me personally. Um, that's the way I grew up. But uh, yeah, it kind of depends sometimes like on the sweetness of the drink. Like if it's really sweet, like when you first taste it, it's like maybe put it on crushed ice just so it'll have the dilution will probably last a little bit longer or happen quicker um versus like cube cube is more for me of like oh okay this drink is like perfect just the way it is after it's been shaken whereas crushed ice is like okay it needs a little help while someone's drinking it um were there any things where you would do a combo of crushed and cubed for shaking we had we had a, a cocktail at our bar but we did the hotel nacional we would do on a combination just fluff uh -huh. it up a little bit uh, it depends. Like some of my bartenders at the Polynesian did like a really good job with certain cocktails that had like, uh, say for example, pineapple juice in it, which foams really well. Um, whereas like I'm old school and I would always fill something up, you know, with cubed ice. These guys were like doing, uh, sometimes four to five cold drop cubes in there and shaking it and getting like a really nice head on it. So it, it, it just kind of depends. It's like with a lot of the stuff that we do, it's, R&D, as we're talking about now, or, you know, um, it's just trial and error. It's just trying to figure out what's, what, what gotcha. works the best. Gotcha. Bree, how did it turn out? It's, it's great. It's great. 
Well, you're biased. Yeah, well, I put yeah. this week and milk on top, so it could be awful, and it's covered in that, so I'm fine. But Yes, the first it, thing I, you're getting is the condensed <laughs> milk, so. It's actually delicious, I, I promise. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's good. It, it takes me back. <laughs> um, oh, so uh, I think Chrissy asked, any condensed milk in the shaken one? Yes. But same thing, she's only doing it as a drizzle at the end on the glass itself. Yeah, just on top. And then I also just wanted to explain the name because um, I just, I, this is really funny to me. Um, Mopri is a slang term in Panama. It's sort of how you like would greet a friend on the street, you know, maybe not your grandma or grandpa or, uh, you know, someone that you respect as your elder, but your comrade. And um I never, I never really thought much about it as a kid growing up, but the slang saying would be que sopa mopri. And finally, somebody explained it to me as an adult that it's, it's que paso primo, but they've like pig Latin, like switched the syllables. And, you know, I don't know. I just love it. So maracuya mopri was what I decided to call it just so I could tell you guys about the pig Latin slang in Panama. That's awesome. I did not know that. That's great. Um, and for those of you who, who don't know, maracuya is just passion fruit. So, oh, and the chinola that she used, that's this guy, the, oh, it's really funny. There we go. The passion fruit liqueur. Um, chinola is the Dominican word for passion fruit. So, um, you know, and in Mexico or no, in Mexico, it's maracuya, but in Puerto Rico, it's parcha. And oh. There's probably other words in other places for it. You, anywhere you travel, you should always find out because it's. Yeah. So, I mean, in all Spanish speaking countries, they just have a different, a different term for passion fruit, which is kind of fun. Um, thank you for that one. Does anybody have, oh, there's one other question. Um, if we only have powdered coffee creamer, how would we incorporate that? Um, I mean, they could technically fluff it up, you know, in the drink, but I feel like the layer is half the fun. Mm. Yeah, so, I'm not sure. And powdered coffee creamer, like, does it have, it has to have some sugar in it already, right? It does. The easiest thing would be just to add some water to that on the side, give it like a, the cream consistency that you want, just like you were doing. Let's say you had powdered milk. You literally could take powdered milk, add some sugar to it, put less water in it than it recommends. So it comes across a little thicker and then drizzle it over the top. It's gonna to be the same the same effect. But also if you can just, a can of condensed milk is like, is really inexpensive. I haven't found a brand I don't like yet. That was another good part of the R&D. Um. <laughs> how, how long have they lasted for you though? Cause that, that's my issue. I, I use barely any. Yeah, as long as you take them out of the like metal container and put them into another um, container into your fridge, they last a really long time. I mean, it's pure sugar, <laughs> to be frank. <laughs> and you can always put a little rum in it as well, just a splash, just to get some. <laughs> no. yeah. um, for those of you who got the Panama Pacific 9 instead of the 5, um, oh, there's a little can right there. Chris and Amy's got a can. Um, if you have the Pan Pacific Nine, it's actually a a, a a bump up in ABV, so it's a it's a higher proof rum than the five. Um, just got a two thumbs up from Christina, who is apparently into things that are higher in alcohol. That's funny. okay. Um, uh, Bree, thank you very much. That was awesome. I I um, can't wait to try this version at home. Uh, for those of you who, you know, once you get your Rums of Origin three box, you'll be able to use some of the other components. Um, if you picked up the Chinola, you, you can use uh, the, some of the components you'll have in the box to, to mix up, you know, maybe your fourth cocktail and make this version of it, which is kind of neat. Um, Brian Miller, mm -hmm. are you ready, to, you ready to dive in? Yeah, I'm gonna start, the, am I making this thing now? Uh, no, right, right now we're just gonna talk about rum classification. Okay, uh, well, pardon me for the notes, but um, there's a lot of different ways that rum can be classified. It was like going down a rabbit hole and I'm a little shocked and disappointed at some of the descriptions, but uh, basically for me, like the best way to 
learn about rum classification, honestly, I thought was Martin Kate's book, uh, Smuggler's Cove, has a really great section on rum classification. And what is reassuring to me is I believe what Martin is, is I believe in what Martin is talking about. But there's like some basic things. I think one of the first things that I, I, I thought was funny, which is actually a quote from Martin Kate, is like, there's a rum for everyone. You just haven't met it yet. <laughs> but uh, so there's different, uh, there's a couple of different categories uh, to go through. One is like there's ages can be a description. Colors can be a description. Uh, there's some other uh, non-colors and non-age descriptions. There's process and there's also uh country you know origin of uh, of rums with aged you've got like lightly aged rums like when you're looking at like white rums uh usually about one to four years old uh they are aged uh for a little bit most of them are aged in uh in barrels for a couple of years um but some people will do charcoal filtration which just kind of takes the color out of it so you make sure that you get this right well uh then you've got like aged rum which is usually like five to 14 years that's where you start to get like the vanilla the leather the oak uh kind of flavors in it and then you have long aged which is like 15 plus years um and that's like meant to be sipped as some people say but uh, I'm going to assume with most of the bartenders in the crowd here, it's like you're only really as good as the product you use. So if you want to use a 15-year-old aged rum in a cocktail, sure, why not? You know, I don't really have a problem with it. Um, oh, you, I, are you, appro you approve? I do. I, I mean, I've yeah. grown up I, I've grown up in bars where I've been spoiled. And it's like, oh, cool. What are you using under my time? I'm like, 12-year-old eh, rum, 15-year-old rum. Like, I don't, I don't really have a problem with it. It's more of... I guess Jurassic Park, where it's like just because you can doesn't mean you should, but I think it's bartender. If you can, why not? Um, then you go into your basic descriptions that we're going to see of like colors. Uh, you've got white and clear, which is usually like pretty mild and light bodied. Uh, then you get what they call gold or pale, and that's a little more aged, kind of medium body. That's what you said with the vanilla, the almond, the kind of creaminess that goes on. Uh, from what I, what I read was like dark was like this is just kind of a lie like dark is it, it, it can be anything from slightly colored to something that's really dark so that incorporates unless it's white rum almost everything is considered dark I guess if you look at if you look at the definition and so that's been one of the tricky things for a lot of people we've gotten a lot of questions not just um, on rums of origin three but in general, over the years on our uh, various rum boxes, uh, we'll see people asking about dark rum. And, and you know, if, some, if there's a call and a recipe for dark rum, they're not usually talking, unless it's a very old book, they're not usually talking about something that is what we consider a dark rum now, like, you know, Myers or, right. or, the, or the plantation dark or... Or like, um, what's the other, Karuba, like some of, you know, and you'll even see like uh, Appleton Reserve, I think that's the name for it now. Uh, that's considered a dark Jamaican rum, which isn't as dark as like, say, Myers. And so it, 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 it offers something different. It's like, you really have to, the only way that I know the things that I know is like, it's tasting. You just got to taste everything, put it in the cocktail, see how it works, remember how something tastes and flavor wise, and then be like, okay, cool. Like when you're creating a cocktail or trying to figure out what rum to put in a drink, you remember the flavors and the smells and be like, okay, this would be perfect. So um, the takeaway from this happy hour then is research, research, research. R and D is very important. Tasting yeah. is like, <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to go to a cocktail class to learn about cocktails. You just have to taste them. That was, Sasha's biggest thing is like well we we, we I mean I'm I'm looking around the video and I see a couple people who are doing their own research right now so that's great it's great I've, I've, yeah. I'm doing my own little research as well uh and then they have like black is another color that they use with rums and that's usually to find something like black strap or even Myers might be considered a, a, a black rum and then you have other categories of like navy strength 
which is usually something that's around 114 proof or higher. Um, it's usually associated with the British Navy. Uh, the whole point of that was like, it needs to be 114 proof because when naval officers got, or the, uh, the grunts got, got their rum, it needed to be high enough proof that if they spilled it on the gunpowder, they'd still be able to light it. So that's the whole point of 114 proof and higher, uh, Navy strength rum. Um, then you have premium aged, which to me, anytime you see the word premium, that's just a marketing term. Like that's just their version of like trying to sell you something more, more, more expensive. But to me, it doesn't really mean anything. Um, but usually those types of rums are like richer and darker in color and more premium. Uh, they'll probably try to tell you, oh, this is a sipping rum or something like that. Um, you move on to vintage, which Plantation is really big into. I love the Plantation vintage rums, the, especially the Jamaica and the Barbados are absolutely fantastic. And they changed throughout the years. I think like with uh, Plantation, it was a 2001 at one point. And actually right now they have a Jamaican that's a 2005 that is fantastic. Um, and probably as close to another rum that's really good, which is Hampton, uh, the Hampton 86, uh, the new Plantation uh, 2005 is like that. Uh, then you have Overproof, Overproof right, white rums definitely go beyond Ray and Nephew. Uh, I think that's what everybody kind of remembers. But for me, I'm fire. <laughs> rum fire. Yeah, rum fire is another one. Um, I really love the rum bar rums from Jamaica. Uh, Oni's, uh, when Bridget owned it, they used to do an overproof rum that was really good. Uh, Thomas Two does a nice white overproof as well. Uh, then they have spice rum, which honestly I don't care about spice rum. I think if you're going to do spice rum, get a gold, you know, and, 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 and make your own. Um, so ju just for the folks at home, like on, uh, Brian sent me his, his notes, like the, how he was breaking up the descriptors <laughs> and there's, there's like a long sentence for everything. And then you get to spice rum. It just says crap. <laughs> It's not something that I like. Like, I don't, it, 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 it's one of those things where, you know, if brands are being like, oh, we're going to do a spice rum. And I'm like, why? Like, Captain Morgan owns that market. No one's ever going to beat them in that market. One quick question, that we're, and we're right on, on that topic. Um, from Jimmy, he asked, uh, is there a categorization for rum that doesn't have additives in it, especially added sugar? Um, there isn't a category for it. Like that's the thing with rum is like rum is kind of like the wild, wild west. There aren't a lot of rules to it. Um, just because sugar is added to rum doesn't make it a bad rum. And sometimes like when you're talking with somebody, uh, like Alexander at plantation, it's like, you're talking about grams of sugar that are added to two bottles. So it's like when you're adding three or four grams of sugar to an entire bottle of rum. It's really not a lot. And there's, there is a stigma with like, oh, it has sugar added to it. Um, I don't think that necessarily makes it bad because like, I like, uh, I like plantation. I like El Dorado. Those have sugars added to it. It doesn't make it bad. It's just like in scotch, you know, a lot of people like single malt and it's like, there are great blended scotches out there. It doesn't have to be a single malt. Um, to be good. And it's the same thing with rum. It's like just because sugar is added to it doesn't mean that it's bad. There are certain things like the more rum you drink and the more you get used to it, like you'll taste things like, uh, you know, even Richard Seal, uh, who does Foursquare, which is an amazing rum. I would drink anything that guy made. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't add any sugar to it, but he's also not, at least my understanding was he was like, just because someone adds sugar doesn't mean that I wouldn't like the rum. It's not my, it, it, it's not his personal preference for how he wants to make rum, but if somebody wants to add sugar to it, to each his own, you know. He, um, Real McCoy is made by him as well too, isn't it? He's, he, he's got a hand in that, yeah. Right, well. yeah. So I, there's a lot of our subscribers who are familiar with that. Um, and for those of you at the beginning who were looking for some of the aged rums um, to have in time for, uh, for the happy hour, there are some folks who picked up the Real McCoy five year because that was a, it was easier for them to get their hands on. Yeah. Yeah. It's a it's, great rum. It's a fantastic rum. I mean, yeah. pretty much uh, just like almost anything that comes out of Jamaica, Joyce Spence probably has her hand in. Uh, anything that comes out of Barbados 
pretty much Richard Seals got his hand somewhere involved. And one other question from Michael Vance uh, is one of the big distinctions for rum, whether it's a molasses or cane juice, which is a great, great question. Well, sure. Yeah, they're divided up. Anything that's made directly from molasses is like a molasses based rum. And then, you know, anything made from sugar cane juice is generally considered agricole. Um, and that's a whole different flavor profile than what you're going to get from molasses based rum. Molasses based rum is going to be, yes, a little bit sweeter, um, but sweet is a relative term. Um, but with agricole, agricole is fantastic. It's a little bit to me kind of like the peated scotch of the rum world. Like not everybody likes peated scotch. Some people, they, they don't want the Octomore or whatever, the super peat or anything like that. And with, uh, agricole, not everybody likes the taste of agricole, but it is, there are so many brands out there that are doing so many different things. I mean, I think Nissan and La Favorite are probably two of my favorites. Uh, one of the, the, I guess, fast risers for me right now is, um, uh, Qua Riviera, which I think is fantastic. I've seen that in Europe for years, but we're finally starting to get it here in the United States. And that's really great. Um, but it's like when you taste those rums next to each other, like I used to be a really big Rum Jam fan and I Rum Jam is great, but you taste it next to Nissan and you're like, whoa, like this is what Agricole is supposed to taste like. Like I think what Nissan does is some of the best in the business. It's also funny that one of your favorites is actually called La Favorite. La <laughs> Favorite, yeah. <laughs> they do amazing stuff. Ed Hamilton, he was the guy that, that, that introduced me to that. So, so uh, two, two quick questions to, to steer us, um, you know, yeah. back onto the Rums of Origin 3. So, like, our, you know, our upcoming boxes are our third time doing it, where all three of the bartenders, like Brie, who created cocktails for this box, used a rum from their country of origin. So you were saying earlier that beyond just the classifications, whether it is, um, you know, color or uh, age statement, the bigger deal to you is uh, what the denomination of origin is for that rum. It, Can you is, 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 it's you mostly like, like where the, you know, uh, for me, more important things is like the country. It's kind of like, you know, if you're like a beer drinker, it's like, okay, cool. You like IPAs or you like lagers. And it's like, okay, cool. I like rum, but I like it from Jamaica or I like it from Guyana or I like it from uh, Barbados. Like that's kind of important. And also the distillation process, you know, whether it's pot still, the column still, they're a combination of both. Like to me, those are more interesting uh, aspects as far as categorization go. Um, Whenever I have visited a distillery, I'm always kind of like, all right, so what makes your rum your rum? Like, what are you, what is a key component? Um, you go to like uh, the Virgin Islands, you go see, go see Crucian out there and they're going to be like, Dude, it's all about our barrel agent. Like that's, that, that's our thing. And yeah, that single barrel, definitely yeah. one, one of my favorites. I miss the old bottle, but <laughs> I wish they never changed the label on that. Um, but then you have you you have other things like with uh, Jamaica, say for example, and you look at something like Appleton, uh, which is a combination of pot and column still, um, and I think what they do is absolutely fantastic, and it has that because of their distillation process with the column and the and the uh, and the pot pot still is they have like this funk, and you know it's due to the dunder. Uh, you know, which is, which is what brings that funk, but like, it's equal to um, say like wild turkey. Like whenever you drink wild turkey whiskey, there's like this distinct flavor in it that you're just like, oh man, this is like wild turkey. It's something that's, that, that's very distinctive. And Jamaican rum kind of has that. It's like that funk in Jamaican rum is like, that's their thing. And Barbados is usually about the weather. It's about, it's about the climate. Um, they're all markedly different, you know, like I said earlier, it's like if you haven't found the right rum, you just aren't looking yet. So it's, it's interesting. So, you know, our first rums of origin box that we did, uh, we had three, you know, vastly different countries from one another. Um, and same thing we did like, you know, an aged rum from three different countries, but one of the, you know, one of the bartenders that was interested in participating was a Jamaican bartender. And I was like, we, we have to do our, a totally separate rums of origin Jamaica. 
You can't. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, as it is, you're going to do like Dominican Republic, Panama, Venezuela, Puerto Rico, Cuba. Like these are all so different it's styles from one another. You could have you could pick one country and do three rums, three different rums from that one country. And they're they're going to be vastly different from one another. So, sure. you know, throwing Jamaica into the mix because of the dunder and because of that, the, the terroir is a totally different animal. It is like looking at something like uh, Guatemala, which everybody knows is like Zacapa. Like that's the thing. Everybody's like, oh, I love Zacapa. I love Zacapa. But there's another rum from their Botran, which does the same thing with the Solera system. And I think it's their 1763 or something like that, 1793, their rum that's slow, is amazing. Like, it's really good, and it's nothing like Zacapa. You oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Get... Michael's got a bottle of that right there. Which one is that, Michael? That's the 12-year. Um, oh, yeah. I got right. it. I got it in Guatemala. Um, I was there a few years ago for a Habitat for Humanity build. Traveling. What's that like? Oh, it's a blast. It's a lot of work. You work your butt off, but they take they take pretty good care of you, too. Um, God, uh, is that I, a giant pork shoulder behind you? <laughs> <laughs> it is. That would be amazing. Nice. Like, wow, some and a pork shoulder would be great. It is. That is, that is, yeah, that is, that was, that was one of my smoked, smoked uh, pork shoulders from the, from this summer. Fantastic. Um, so I want to I want to take the group to our, our next topic, which uh, for those of you who have joined us before for happy hour um, and Brian, we're going to for those of you who, who uh, asked Brian some questions, we're going to get back to a Q&A in a little bit. But please feel free to uh, add a couple things um, if you'd like into the chat. We will we'll get to that. Um, one of the things we like to touch upon um, every month or every time we do a happy hour is the status of the hospitality industry. So. We discuss like the current plight of the bartenders, who's helping, what's impactful. But again, everything um, changes every five minutes. So, um, you know, for example, Breeze working at Boat Drinks in St. Augustine, which is completely open. Uh, and yeah, where, whereas, you know, we're here in the Bay Area. And as of last Friday, all indoor dining shut down again. So um, everybody's going through different things. So. What I wanted to ask was, um, you know, for everybody, for the, the two of you to tell me from your perspective, uh, you know, Bree as, as a bartender, what was that, that time like for you and how is it now? So that the time of like being unemployed, you mean? Yes. Yes. The because when you said earlier, you're like nothing like being, a, you know, nothing like being in quarantine with a bartender or, you know, it's pretty great to be a bartender during quarantine. Well, yes. Except for when there's no income. Yeah. That was, I was, maybe that was the rum talking. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but I mean, there was, you know, there was actually a lot of brands that were reaching out. Um, there wasn't a lot of federal help specific to restaurants. Like me as a singular bartender, I was actually, pretty well taken care of with unemployment during that time. Florida doesn't really have a lot, but um, during that time when the government was, was helping out each week, but for business owners, I'm, I'm sure that it was a whole heck of a lot more stressful. And there's, you know, a lot of bars, even in my town that, that haven't been able to reopen um, that they shuttered their doors and there hasn't been any kind of specific help for them. Um, but the one thing that was nice was like brands were doing a lot of, um, small like paid gigs you know kind of a happy hour make a cocktail make a video you know let's work together and, and that was a really nice like sense of community and sense of support um the comment i made earlier was like my roommate's a school teacher and so um great time to live with a bartender because i've heard her say that <laughs> like just now i was like hey do you want this other drink yeah I that's like uh, you know a lot of a lot of friends who are who are parents um, also wish that they had a bartender that lived with them. I think um, any anytime I stop at, at at friends' homes who who have um, a child or children, they're like, um, any chance that you have any secrets <laughs> and cocktails you can bring back? And you got to you got to get them to do the Mad Men thing where they teach the kids young. You know, when the guy Don Draper would get home on Mad Men and he'd say. 
forget his daughter's name, but he'd say like, go make me a Manhattan, you know, and she'd say, you want it perfect? <laughs> like, just teach him young. It's fine. Yeah, it's like, exactly. It's like Auntie Mame, you know, she's like the worst thing about children is they use too much vermouth in their martinis. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, is there is there anybody in um, in sort of the panhandle or the northern part of Florida that we're doing some some really great things to to benefit the industry, especially those who are having fairly hard times themselves. Did you see something that really sort of brightened your day? I mean, not not anything super life changing or major. You know, the things that that were great that did brighten my days were um, a couple like of brand of the brands would buy meals you know at like a local restaurant because a lot of if if you aren't a bartender or have been in the industry like the way that a lot of these brand representative jobs work is you know a lot of times they have accounts and they have money that they can spend and if bars aren't open and they're not going out to their accounts and spending money at them um taking people out they're kind of sitting on this so what i did see that a lot of brands did which was really nice in my small town is that they would take that money to their account, which was a restaurant that was struggling doing to go. And they would buy, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 or however many meals. And then they would offer them to hospitality, to people who worked in the hospitality industry. So it's kind of a two birds, one stone thing that they did there where they were supporting the business. And then they were also supporting like hungry hospitality workers. So that was pretty nice, but I didn't see a whole lot of, um, large like grant programs or relief programs but again i'm just the bartender so i don't know Understood. yeah brian what were you seeing in um in brooklyn it's or in new york it, it's pretty bleak to be honest um it's it, it it's really hard like i've tried to you know as i've discussed with you before about making the transition and like maybe doing some uh some brand work but I don't think brands here know exactly what to do uh, because it's not like it's not like Florida where uh, or certain parts of the country where it's like things are more open. Uh, you know, we just closed the schools yesterday. Uh, so and everybody that I know that's working in a bar right now is talking like it's going to close again. There's going to be another uh, another shutdown. Um, but it's one of those things you can't like get too depressed over because it's like everybody's going through a hard time like there's not one person that's like oh you're more deserving than anyone else like there's you know certainly people with families and stuff like that that are finding it really hard to support and i just think for brands to start like i've been talking to brands and they're just i don't know like what do you think we should do and it's like I owned a bar. When I did a job interview, I didn't call somebody in and go, what job do you think you're good for? Like, I, I, I knew exactly what I wanted someone to do. And I'm not getting that uh, type of response from brands. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's hard. It's hard on the industry, especially, you know, someone like myself and, 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 and my uh, age group of people were of a certain age that, like, you know, bars aren't looking to hire like older bartenders, you know, one, it's just a risk, you know, you don't, if you're a bar owner, it's like, do you really want to risk putting your staff out there? Um, you know, because contrary to popular belief, young people can get sick. Like everybody thinks that this is, it's a disease that's, uh, you know, affects everybody, doesn't matter what your age is. And yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you're super close to Long Island bar where, you know, Toby was one of the first people to be affected by it. And um, I think we talked about this actually a few months ago at Happy Hour, but if you guys look up, there's an article um, by Toby Ciccini. Oh, New York him Times. and his wife, yeah. Really I incredible mean, um, about, you know, what he went through as both a bartender and a bar owner um, living in New York. And it was very early on um, and also had like some asthma and things like that. But there's also guys like him who... Um, are doing like every single thing they can to help everybody else. It's a very much like a rising tide raises all ships thing. Uh, for those of you who are in the Shaker and Spoon um, private Facebook group, um, I, I, Souther has posted a couple of things uh, 
companies that bartenders either have started or own on the side where they're, you know, making hot sauce or like that puzzle that he did or um, have created recipe books or are doing like virtual happy hours and things like that. Take a look for those kinds of things. Anything that you can do, especially if you're already enjoying shaker and spoon cocktails at home. Um, if you were not able to go to a bar nearby, find out what that, what your local is doing because they might have a to-go program or something to help support their team. There's all kinds of cool stuff that's going on that will, um, you know, help the, the booze continue to flow, if you will. But um, thank you guys. That's, that's awesome. Um, I'm going to, we're going to dive into Brian uh, creating the abstract distraction, which is a pretty great segue, I think. Yeah, it's, I, well, the cocktail was already created. I'm kind of doing like a riff on it, if I'm correct. Yes. Uh, so it's, this is actually a great thing for people that are trying to learn about cocktails is what I've done here is essentially it's the Mr. Potato Head theory. Um, you know, you take off the eyeglasses, you give them sunglasses, you take off the top hat, you give them, you know, a baseball hat. And it's something that, like, I grew up with, uh, especially at Death and Company, but it's something that you, if, if you've ever read uh, Gaz Regan's R.I.P. Um, book, The Joy of Mixology, he brings up the first thing that he, one of the things he talks about there is like a margarita and a sidecar. And like, what's the difference? And like, as a bartender, you're like, okay, cool. Margarita is like tequila, lime, Cointreau. And sidecar is brandy, lemon, Cointreau. You know, you just take the lemon out for the lime or the, you know, uh, tequila out for uh, the cognac. And it's just, it's really simple. And once you kind of understand uh, certain pairings, like especially with juice, uh, lemon juice is great with whiskey. Um, you know, lime juice is great with like tequila and gin and, and, and rum and vodka. And once you learn those pairings, then you can kind of switch things out. Um, and in this, uh, you gotta be honest, I was really quite surprised like how well this turned out using uh, the Tandaway, if I'm pronouncing this correctly. Yeah, Tandaway, yeah. And Tandaway rum, which is what, the most popular rum in the entire world, I think. Yes, yeah. Um, and it was, it's, it, it's really a nice little kind of like workhorse rum, uh, especially in this cocktail. I was really pleasantly surprised uh, how well like the vanilla notes in the rum pair with uh, the rose jam that's in this as well. Um, it's really good. It adds kind of a creaminess to it. And it's like I was alluding to earlier, uh, the more you start to play with spirits and the more you start to play with sweeteners and juices and stuff like that, you'll figure out different pairings. Like when I was creating menus for Tiki Monday, there were certain times where it's like, okay, it needs just a little bit of fat. It needs either a little honey or like, I became well versed in like when I wanted to add or shot to a recipe, like when I was looking for that kind of almond creaminess in a cocktail and how we take it to another level. Um, so I guess I get going with this little thing. Here. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Um, so for those of you who are, are unfamiliar with this, this is a, uh, this is a, a cocktail that was created by Nova Clark, who was uh, one of the shaker and spoon bartenders from the Reposado Mescal box. And um, I wanted to use it as an example today, not only to talk about how to do this hot swapping, or as Brian called it, like the Mr. Potato Head thing, where you can swap out spirits, because there's a lot of rum, just rum cocktails, where people will take one rum and replace it with another rum, and it's a vastly different drink. And different is fine, unbalanced is not. So this is something that's calling for a lightly aged Reposado Mezcal, but that's a very dry finish. Um, and to replace it with something that is 40% ABV and potentially is you know, um, a sweeter product and doesn't have the smoke, isn't necessarily gonna balance out that rose lemonade or the rose strawberry jam like the Mezcal would. So, um, you know, Brian went with the Tanduai, which is 40% dry finish it's still a rum definitely sweeter than mezcal but as he said he was like i was you know ha uh, pleasantly surprised that it balanced out nicely 
Yeah, because I didn't have the mezcal to know what it originally tastes like. <laughs> so uh, going with um, the rum, it was just, it, it was really interesting. And so with this cocktail, uh, you have the rose, rose strawberry uh, jam. Just put a little spoonful of that in there. And then your cute little lemon bitters bottle. Um, it calls for essentially two dashes, which in case you don't know, and I've done extensive practice with this, 12 drops. 12 drops equals one dash um, in this. And then we'll do uh, two ounces of rum. Throw this in there. Uh, I believe Miss Clark was like, oh, you can stir it up. I'm like, let's just make it a little bit easier and just dry shake it. And you just give it a little whip to mix up the jam and everything in it. And then Sorry, let's grab some ice. So the other reason that I wanted to have Brian show off this particular cocktail is because he actually has an ice crusher machine, like a manual ice crusher. And it really, <laughs> Bree is giving a thumbs up. Um, it's, it's one of the things that like, if you look at the shaker and spoon, like the quick little 30 second video, um, it's definitely using the Lewis bag to crush it up but Brian is gonna show you how he uses his actual grind or his crusher. Well, sometimes the difference, like what, what, what Brie was doing is, 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 you know, as she's talking like shave ice, um, it's more like snowflake ice. And that's something that like, if you don't like what I'm gonna do with this drink, um, it's just something I just learned at Death and Company, uh, was anything that I put on crushed ice and in this machine I get like really chunky uh, kind of crushed ice. You want to cool uh, the alcohol down just a little bit. You're not diluting it a lot. You're just trying to get it cold. So when it does hit the crushed ice, it doesn't immediately melt. Whereas we, I think with Brie, it's like that shave ice, that's just going to melt immediately. As soon as you hit that with alcohol, like it's, it, it's going to go down. And with this, I was lucky enough, this was a gift from uh, Avery Glosser of uh, Bitterman's Bitters, uh, gave this to me for my 40th birthday. Uh, it's just simple. It's a little hard to tell. I'll see if I can kind of point this up there. But you've got like little spikes that just kind of rotate around in here. I did some beforehand. But you just throw the ice in there, close the lid down, grind it up. It took me a while to figure this out when I first got it. But it just pops off the bottom here and creates really good crushed ice. So what I'm going to do here, just to start off, I always, anything I put on crushed ice, I just do three ice cubes just to get it a little bit cold. Just like a quick little, little shake, you'll start to feel uh, the shaker get cold in your hand. You know, okay, cool. Grab the glass, fresh dice. Yeah, yeah I can kind of see it. It's chunky, um, which is better so the uh, so things don't uh, melt so quickly. It's one of the the jokes I used to tell people when like ice was becoming super popular and it's like oh we have all these different kinds of ice and I was like no you don't there's one kind of ice and it's the frozen kind you have different shapes yes but there aren't different kinds of ice there's different shapes of ice mm -hmm. um, can I so, say something real quick yeah um for anyone who lives near a sonic if oh, you yes. had the sonic the, that like crushed pebble ice they sell it in bags there so if you're having a party and you want to have the chewy ice those little pebbles it's like two dollars and fifty cents i'm assuming sonic's everywhere the same but um yeah you can just buy bags of it and it's the best ice you just got a massive amount of thumbs up from people Sonic. Yeah, it's it's That's so fun and honestly if you have like a a garage freezer or like a, you know, somewhere where you have extra space, it's worth just going to get a couple bags and, and throwing them in there. A, it makes your freezer work less. Um, if you have, you know, larger chunks of ice or more ice in your freezer, but they're really fun to just go and open it up and take a scoop and not even think about it. Let it spill all over the counter because you, because you have it plentifully. We just got a new fridge that actually does pebble ice and I'm pretty pumped about it. 
the um the bar that I work at now that's the only ice that we use is the pebble ice and so it's also cool if you like have a, a little bit of it you only need just a couple little pieces and you can whip shake it into your drink and it'll like perfectly dilute it and chill it we also do keep all our liquor cold to start so but it's it's fun to play with to serve your drinks on and also to to shake with and see what that does Brian, can you show them the ice crusher? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this is the ice crusher. The closer. Ice Bring it closer. Sorry. There we go. That's the ice crusher. You can kind of see the claws in there. Once you fill it up with ice, you just crank it. comes out the bottom. So then it's like in the – I didn't put it in there. But. It's like uh, an elementary school um, uh, pencil sharpener, like the old the – Yes. Yeah, one of those, when I first got this, I was like, how do I get the ice out of this thing? <laughs> like, I couldn't figure out how to, like, open the bottom of it. Um, and I also have uh, really cheap, uh, on Amazon, they have a little thing uh, you can find. It's just called Hawaii Shave Ice. And it's just like a little electronic machine. You just drop cubes in it, and you push it down, and it just shapes the ice. And I think it was, like, 25 bucks or something like that. All of a sudden, so, we're going to get a call from Amazon being like, What's the deal, Shaker and Spoon? All of a sudden, there's like 300 people who want the stupid Hawaiian it's shave. Literally ice. called Hawaiian shave ice. Like it's it's pretty easy. So uh, this is the cocktail. Uh, I love the little flowers on top. Um, really simple, easy, refreshing. It's one of those things where you can, uh, you know, Mr. Potato Head is a is something that's really easy to uh, practice and use and make different cocktails. You know, it's like I think it all started with like the last word. Then we switched, Bill Ward switched out the lemon juice or the lime juice for lemon, switched out the gin for rye, and then you have the final ward. And I think he's beat that drum into the ground where he's done it with tequila and mezcal and uh, scotch and almost any spirit you can switch out and make that combination. On that note, for example, um, hold up the bottle of rum so folks can see it. Just mm -hmm. bring it close to the camera. Yeah, sorry. Right. So this is the Tandwa. You guys have seen this on, on Shaker and Spoon. Now, it, it, even if you were to, like we were talking about before, like we could do, um, you know, a rums of origin, all uh, Dominican Republic. We did one that was all Jamaica and, you know, the products were vastly different for each other. Brian has the Tandwa. I have this one, which is the, the Don Papa. Uh, not, by the way, not to be confused with Papa's Pilar. So um, just make sure that you keep those as safe. But Don Papa is actually a rum from the Philippines. Uh, but if, if I were to swap in this, some, a drink that Brian or anyone created with Tandawai Gold, and I swapped in the Don Papa, um, which is like a, you know, they call it Don Papa small batch. It'd be very different. It's, it's much more rich. There's more, more of that vanilla um it's a very different much more rounded profile as opposed to as brian uh, called tandoi gold a workhorse it's going to work for sipping by itself it's going to work great in drinks um but it's definitely a little bit drier and a little more of an of an oomph right so even things that have the same denomination denomination of origin you can't just swap them out and expect the exact same thing it's still going to be a great drink but it would definitely end up being a little bit sweeter if i were to use the the Don Papa instead of the Tandoi Gold for this particular yeah. cocktail. You were to make a drink with Zacapa and then try it with the, the Botran. It's going to be a definitely a different drink, you know, gotcha. just based on how they make it. You know? One one quick question from you. Michael Vance wanted to know the brand of the ice crusher that you showed off. <laughs> Shit. Uh, it's a vintage thing called uh, Isomat. Um. Yeah, you can go to vintage stores. I've seen these around and stuff like that. It's like it's just the little the, the little hand crusher, um, really easy uh, for an old man like me. I don't want to beat a bunch of ice. It's a little bit easier just to like grind it, grind it out. Um, one of the other questions from earlier was, since there are no rules for rum, what is the age statement protocols? Which is one of the few actual rules, but. Go ahead. It is, uh, from what I understand, the age statement protocol is when you see it on a bottle, that is the youngest rum that's in the, that's in that bottle. So like in an El Dorado 15, the youngest rum in there is a 15-year-old rum. And there could be, you know, there's, there's probably some 21 in there. There may be a little bit of those 25. 
Um, and it's not even the amount. It is just if you're adding rums, if you're blending rums together, uh, aged rums, you've got to put uh, the age of the uh, of the youngest rum in there. If there's no age statement at all, if there's no number on it at all, is it really young likely or just a mismatch? It's going to depend on the color. I mean, if it's white, you know, it, it's it's aged anywhere between one and four years. Um, you know, there's there there are definitely some uh, tricks out there, like you will see uh, for one Zacapa 23. That's not a 23 year old rum. I don't even know where the hell they get that number, to be honest. Same thing with like Bacardi 8. Bacardi 8 is not an eight year old rum. Uh, Coxburr has a 12. It's like Coxburr 12. It's not a 12 year old rum. Yeah, I don't know why. That it doesn't say year on it. Yeah. So, like, yeah. so I mean, the, the, the discussion about Zacapa, from what I understood, was that it was predominantly between six and 12. But they, because there was Solera systeming in, it had bits of a 23 year, but they had to remove the age statement and just have it as a cup of 23. Yeah, but that still doesn't keep people from thinking that it's a 23 year. No, 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 of course. Yeah. Oh, well, if they it's want to think that. that on their own. Yeah, you know. For that. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, thought, we have a sorry, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, I thought that's what the, uh, um, you know, there was a big article on, on rum in the imbibe that you, that was in the last uh, that was in the last box in the mezcal box, and one of the things they said was that basically, yeah, don't trust the number on the label; that it's meaningless. <laughs> Not unless it has a year next to it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and and even then, you never yeah. know. Um, so, a question for Bree: is, Someone had asked before, um, any substitutes for chinola if you can't find it? Um, there are other passion fruit liqueurs out there that are much sweeter um because what's chinola is what 21 percent the chinola is 21 percent yeah, yeah. The, okay. um, the i you know the it, initially when i did the recipe i was using passion fruit um like pulp into a syrup yeah. and um there's you, you can find that and substitute that like as a simple syrup but i'm not familiar with any other names of passion fruit um, brands. There, there's, there's one, there's one out of Brazil. Oh, that's it. Passoa. Yeah. Um, it's, it's owned by, um, God, Alize, Alize is a little bit different. Um, that, that involves putting it on ice cream and listening to LL Cool J, which is a very <laughs> different scenario. Um, but, uh, the, the Passoa I think is made by bowls, if I'm not mistaken. And it's very good, but it's definitely like much more sweet. It's like if you were to have a passion fruit syrup that was made, you know, uh, from what's what's the name of the um, the one that comes in the white frozen blocks? The French company it starts with oh, there's, the, yeah. There's Boirin. There's yeah, the Puree. Right. Like those are to me, those are better to use the passion fruit puree. The, the Shinola, I've heard very good things about it. I've tasted it, it's good. But I think the thing that's, that's you know, bum between Barry, it always talks about like when using passion fruit, it's like, it's better to use a puree because then you can decide later whether you want to add sugar to it or right. just use it, you know. Right. And I mean, that's one of the reasons why I like the Shinola because it's right where I want it to be as far as the level of, like you're talking about Mr. Potato Head, if I'm gonna swap things out, it's at the, the sweetness level that I want for a liqueur and I can do it as a, as a modifier or like as Brie did it where she did one and one. She almost did a, a split base um, yeah, this, on the first one. That one's done really well. I know I, I, I usually love their stuff, but Shafar does a passion fruit liqueur and it's terrible. They're all so different that if yeah. you did try something, what I liked about the Chinola was it really had a lot of the passion fruit, um, just the flavor of the fruit and wasn't as uh, like syrupy, um, which is why I had to add the honey to it. Yeah. It didn't taste fake. It didn't taste like it didn't have that artificial quality to it. And it didn't need, it also didn't taste like it was made from like pure grain alcohol. So it was, it's a really nice in between. Yeah, um, I think that's. There's, I, there's I agree one with you. Here, 
if, if anyone's like really, really wants to make a passion fruit syrup at home, though, there is a company that I highly recommend that's based out of Miami, Florida, and it's called Primore Foods, E-R-I-M-O-R. And you can get it on Amazon and everything I've tried from them is amazing. They have passion fruit, they have uh, pink guava, guanabana, all tropical. This is, this is syrups? They're like concentrates. They have a little bit of sugar and some citric acid added to them. So they're very shelf stable. They come to you um, cold and needing to be refrigerated, but um, they're, they're so, so good. I'll type it in the chat if anyone's into it. Yeah, and Boron is it's the French um, company that does the um, what? What did you just call it, Brian? The um, they do all kinds of purees. The purees, they do, thank you. Yeah, they so, do, they they do purees, and the thing that I really like about them is like they're not really sweet. Like if you have the passion fruit, like it's tart. And yeah, it's we had really to. Good it, 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 it's it's you're you're basically eating passion fruit. We had for Tonga room, we had yeah. to add sugar to it. Yeah, and so, it, I'd, I'd rather do it that way. Yeah. I'd rather be in control of the sweetness than, than yeah. have it pre-mixed in. Exactly. Um, hold on, we have a couple more questions for you guys. Um, and we got that one. Uh, oh, yeah. So somebody had asked about what was the name of the book. That was The Joy of Mixology. That's Gary Regan. Um, yeah, yes. And if you... There are so many great things in that book. I mean, first of all, he's hilarious. He's yeah. a great writer, super cheeky. Um, it's one of the earlier cocktail books before this sort of, you know, platinum age of cocktails um, that started in like the mid 2000s. Um, yeah, that he, was like, that was ahead. one of the books. Uh, I, I'm sorry, Donnie. Uh, no, go ahead. That like, that and Dale's original craft of the cocktail, like that, uh, Charles Schumann's American Bar, like these were big staple books in the beginning. And Gaz's uh, The Joy of Mixology is just great, if for nothing else than the showing how to break down cocktails from like the margarita to uh, the sidecar. But as you said, uh, he's hysterical. Uh, he's one of the funniest. He was one of the funniest and most charming people I've ever met in the industry. Uh, his cocktails in the country was, was great. To just listen yeah. to him tell stories. Yeah. You, you, you didn't even have to have him make you the drink. By the time you got the drink, you had forgotten that you had ordered one. And uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, Consumer bartender. The, the, one of the, one of the questions that, um, that comes up a lot uh, is the concept of cultural appropriation when it comes to, uh, tiki, right? So we, we try really hard to use the, the term tropical drinks um, because they're really about the concept of, of escapism and being in the tropics. And, you know, they really are, you can have a bar that's tropical that isn't necessarily using, you know, totems or pieces of various people's culture to like amuse other people. So um, there's a there's a great article that uh, Sam Jimenez wrote, um, being of of Samoan descent. If you guys want to check that out, uh, we, we can include that link in the post tomorrow. That's a really great one. But um, you know, Brian had a really good way of distilling down why, like, why we want to call it tropical and and what's appropriate and what's not. I mean, I it's. If you look at it historically, it's like, look, I spent my entire career, like most of my career using the word tiki. Uh, but if you look at it historically, Don the Beachcomber never referred to any of his cocktails as tiki cocktails. Um, they were tropicals or they were rum rhapsodies. Um, and it, it, it is a thing that is a, it is a touchy subject. Um, I've been interviewed about it. I've been berated on the street about it. Um, and it's one of the things that I tried to do with the Polynesian was shine a light on a culture. Um, I didn't have goofy, uh, you know, the obviously sometimes inappropriate glasses that like look like an Asian person, you know, with a giant mustache and, it, you know, it, and, and being able to respect people where it's like, we, this is kind of a movement that does involve uh, gods for the Polynesian culture. And so to uh, 
turn them into caricatures and cartoons, I know is disrespectful, but like at the Polynesian, what I tried to do ultimately was I, I, I wanted to inspire people to understand that like every time I was creating a design at the bar, you know, or, 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 or using an element at the bar that involved the culture, I wanted people to get inspired and like want to understand it more. Um, you know, I named drinks, some of which were, I, I know people probably couldn't pronounce, but it was like the Hokuliao, which was a punch that I did that was based on a sailing society that um, uh, Eddie Aikau uh, helped bring back. And Eddie Aikau is a famous Hawaiian. It was a surfer, uh, a surfer that won the big wave competition, brought back the Hawaiian uh, sailing society and oddly, uh, tragically, like died in a very, uh, when they went out on their first mission, I think it was in the 70s, of the bringing this, the sailing society back. The sailing society is based on the original wayfarers in Hawaii that they sailed by the stars. They would make a trek to Tahiti and they would sail mainly by the stars. And we, aside from the punch I had there, some of the dividers in the booths were actually Polynesian stick maps navigational stick maps. Eddie died. Uh, they went, what was it? I think it was like three days out. Storm came, boat got disabled. He literally hopped on a surfboard and paddled back into shore to try to get help. Eventually they got rescued, but Eddie was never found again. And, you know, learning about him and, and learning about Don, uh, was it Kwanamoko, the, the guy who brought big wave surfing basically to the rest of the world, you know, you, you get involved in a culture and it's, for me, some of the greatest compliments I got at the Polynesian were like people of Hawaiian descent that were like, this place is great. I'm like, yeah. When you look at the history of what's going on of, of the word, one, it's not really used in the cocktail. And there's two kind of points of reference for it. One is Thor Heyerdahl, uh, the Norwegian explorer who carved a boat out of balsa wood and traveled from South America to the Pacific Islands. Uh, it's over 5,000 miles. The name of his boat was the Contiki, which has been the name of bars. There's been movies that have been about it. Um, but there's also some of the birth of the word comes from Hei Tiki, H-E-I-T-I-K-I, which is a fertility god in the Samoan culture. Um, and it was a pendant that uh, usually women women wore within the culture, and that's another form of like where the word comes from. But uh, you know, it's been bastardized and changed and reinterpreted over the years. But instead of calling it tiki, I think, as you said, Donnie, is like tropical. I think is, is 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 a much better word. It's also when I started doing tiki Mondays, I didn't want to just do rum. I wanted to show that you could make tropical drinks with sake, with scotch, with tequila, and be, you know, I don't know about the rest of you, but I wasn't invited to every party as a little kid. So I wanted to make sure everybody got invited to the party. So I would do different spirits. So everybody would come in and be like, oh, cool. This is a tropical drink. It's got scotch in. Great. I mean, I, I, I'm going to go on and say, go on a limb and say that Brian created one of, one of the best modern tropical drinks period which is called the winchester and instead of it's basically a gin zombie it's it's a it's a um it uses three types of gin um uh, a london dry a um uh, a, a navy strength and then an aged gin um and and then also has you know elderflower liqueur in it and it's just this beautifully like tall crushed ice thing that you would never really consider before to be like a tropical drink because it has gin in it. But honestly, the South side when made properly tall is still one of the best, yeah. most refreshing tropical drinks out there. And that's all gin. Yeah. It's just a way of just getting people to, uh, in, as I said, invite more people to the party. You know, yeah. it's like one of the first tropical drinks I ever did was the Gantz tomb. And that was like, Death and Company was like, 
the room of stirred and boozy. All we do is serve hard drinks for hard people, you know, and it was like, cool, I'm going to take Rittenhouse Ride, which you all put up on a pedestal. I'm going to put it in a tropical drink and make you love it. And that was, and it's just, it, it's fun. That type of challenge, I think it's fun as a bartender when someone says, you can't do this. And it's like, cool, that's what I'm going to do then. And that's one of the fun things here also is to, uh, is like with the shaker and spoon kits is to be able to like basically Mr. Potato Head or hot swap those things out and just experiment around and see, you know, maybe your favorite, um, you know, Blanco tequila drink is actually a really exquisite, uh, you know, gin drink. You never know. And you don't have to be a bartender to be able to like create a drink. Like one of the lessons I learned early on was watching with, with Audrey Saunders at Peggy Club, like she was doing something and it had strawberries in it. And she's like, oh, I'm going to put this black pepper tincture in it. And I was like, how did you come up with black peppers and strawberries? And she's like, pastry book, Brian. And I was like, oh, okay. Like, don't don't touch a book by its cover. Like you gotta yeah. you gotta taste it and, and, yeah. and see how things are. Um, two quick things. Uh, number one is I'm all for people yelling at you on the street. That's for the record. <laughs> totally down with that. Um, you know, I would hope it would be for different reasons, but that's fine. So I'm all into that. Um, uh, hold on a second. Like, skirt is an easy target. Oh, and you're, uh, Brian's drink is on punch drink called the Double Barrel Winchester. Yeah, that's that. That was the second iteration of it, and honestly, it's better. Um, and for the young woman who was like, "I like high proof drinks," there's even more alcohol in it and a higher proof yeah. alcohol. Yeah, it didn't start off with not a lot in it either. So to ram yeah, it up, you know, it, it, it's like the old Don the Beachcomber rule, which was one what one rum can't do, three rums can. <laughs> so I just turned that around and put gin instead of rum in it. Um, and one more question for Bree, which was, we didn't really get back to it, but um, is there a way to figure out the proportions using a passion fruit syrup instead of a liqueur? Um, I would, I would say to, it's just going to take testing. It's just going to take testing. Yeah, yeah. Maybe try it out in the proportions that I have it right now. And before you even go through all the trouble of freezing it, you can always, you know, dry taste your drinks, which you can do also if you're experimenting with making cocktails at home, a great thing to do before you chill it and shake it or whatever is just give it a little taste before you do that. And, um, you know, di dilution is really important for your drink though. So absolutely, absolutely. But if you taste it in that moment and it's already, Kind of like, or like Bri, would you say that that's it, it's pretty tart to begin with? The drink is tart, yeah, yeah. No, but the 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 chinola, the chinola. Yes, the chinola is more tart than sweet, in my opinion. I, I so, would say if you if you're gonna make it with puree, I would start probably two to one puree. Yeah, to puree, I, would, I put in our notes the puree. Mm -hmm. I would cut it with simple syrup first, like the Primor passion fruit puree that I wrote down there is like the one that you were talking about. It on its own is so tart, even though it has a little bit of sugar to preserve it. It's so tart that I would cut that with um, a just one-to-one -one ratio of your puree to your sugar, and then sub that in for the same amount in the recipe and then adjust from there. Um, and then, you know, Lynn made a good point. It's just more of an opportunity for R&D, guys. So if, if you end up having to make two drinks instead of one, nobody's going to cry about it, I think. Yeah, take, take little notes as you do stuff because you definitely will forget the more that you research and develop, the more you'll forget the, the subtleties. So I always have a tape, a, a roll of um, like blue tape, painter's tape or masking tape or whatever in a Sharpie in my kitchen. And um, like for this drink in the freezer, I just would write down my proportions on the tape and put it on the container so I didn't mix it all up. Yeah. Um, as, a, as a strange tip on that, if you guys are ever going to do that, especially like on Tupperware containers or what have you, make sure that you put the, the, the tape onto the container first before you put it in the freezer because it will, it will just come off and then nothing you have will be labeled anymore. And before, yeah. before you fill it with the liquid as well, because if your liquid is cold that you're yes. putting in there, it'll immediately right. connect. So just tape it off first. So, uh, we, too. we ran a little bit long, but this is, you know, a great topic and um, we could wax poetic on rum forever. 
but we know that people would also like to um, potentially, uh, you know, drink off screen. But <laughs> a, couple, a couple things, um, we, we're going to do our sort of end of our happy hour trivia. So the way this works, for those of you who have not participated before, if you know the answer, you have to put it into the chat to everyone, not to Shaker and Spoon, but to the everyone, and make sure it goes through. And the first one, the first correct answer that comes through um, will actually be the winner. So the two things we're doing today, we're going to do uh, two prizes. One of them is going to be um, a, um, a bottle of the Chinola um, and rum to go along with it. And then an extra little something down the road that you're going to have to maybe wait for until, you know, Bree's cocktail is made into an individual kit. So you'll have to wait for that part. So you have to make sure that you save enough of the rum and the Chinola for later. But um, if you get the, the Bree trivia question right, you will be able to recreate that cocktail. And if you get the Brian trivia question right, you're going to get the abstract distraction kit as well as a bottle of rum to be able to make it. So uh, the first question, the Brie question is going to be, please tell me what the name of the cocktail she made means. Do they have to answer it in pig Latin? Dude, that's what we can get away, man. <laughs> but yes. Okay, stuff is starting to come through. Uh, greeting for friends. How's it going? How are you? Hey, compadre. I love Dude. that. In terms of my nephew. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so any would any of these look correct to you, Bray? Oh, she's got an alarm going off. Hold on. Sorry, false alarm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the hey, compadre, I mean, is a little form. Like, yeah, I think hey, compadre is the... Okay, there you go. So that so Kristen snags that one. The next one is a little bit harder because um, it's a it's a, it's a two parter, and you guys have to spell it correctly. Okay. Oh, no. oh wow. Okay. Yeah. That's what, All right. That's what yeah. For. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so it's a, it's a two parter. All right. The first thing is, what's the name of the Norwegian explorer whose balsa wood boat sailed from South America to French Polynesia? That's number one. And then the second part is, what is the name of the god of fertility in the Maori culture? Damn, Michael Vance. Nailed it. Okay. You got it. Michael, That's I need nice the second one now. Chris, though. <laughs> I, need the, I need the second one, Michael, if you want to nail it down. It's a two-parter. <laughs> but, yeah, I had to look that one up, so... There's movies about it. I think it's on Netflix, actually. <laughs> okay. I'm still... So, yeah, we've got... No? We've got a couple people that have, like, some of the stuff and all the stuff. So I need both of them. One and two. It's a two-parter. <laughs> um, and by the way, Brian, I don't know if you can see it, but... Um, Chrissy has said that she met uh, Thor on the uh, on a on her flight to Copenhagen, which I thought was pretty funny. Really? Wow. Uh, no, Michael Vance. That's that is that is not the correct one. There you go. That's oh, it. there we go. Victoria yeah. got it. Victoria. Victoria got it. Somebody so, knows how to Google fast. Yeah, it's it's Thor Heyerdahl and Hey Tiki. So t like a lot of people just call the Maori god Tiki, but Hey Tiki is like the the that's the uh, that. Yeah, the full name. But that's awesome. So um, our, our two winners are Kristen and Victoria. So that worked out really nicely. Um, but anyway, what I'm going to do real quick is I'm going to take a little bit of this rum and uh, I'm going to do a, a toast. So everybody who's still with us, raise your glass. And thank you. Huge thanks to, um, to Bree and to Brian for joining us today and, and sharing um, your knowledge and your expertise and your love of rum. And of course, to everybody, all of our, our Shaker and Spoon family, thank you guys so much for joining us. We're, we always love to have you. And um, here's to uh, a wonderful uh, Thanksgiving to everybody as well. Everybody has something to give thanks for. Cheers. Thanks, Cheers. thanks everybody.